Tal Newman, and I am from the Diver Medic and Dan Europe. And our special guest today on our live webinar is Ellen Kerlitz. Um, I love the way the ADEX said it. What Kerlitz? <laughs> it was so so sweet. Um, uh, Ellen just recently just had a talk on ADEX um, and. Um, on photography as well but obviously she's here with us live and if i can just tell you a little um dan or says hello ellen and chantal hello dan or Hi, um, dan. so ellen is um an ocean advocate photographer explorer mm -hmm. ellen kurlitz is an international award-winning underwater photographer ocean advocate and visionary ellen was inducted into the ocean art society and accepted as a fellow international in the explorers club where she serves as a member of the flag and honors committee so if you want to go on um, an expedition she's the one to um see whether you are worthy enough <laughs> it's a committee, it's a committee. <laughs> Um, in June 19, uh, 1917, um, in June 2017, Ellen addressed heads of state at the World Ocean Day at a General Assembly of the United Na Nations, highlighting the plight of photographers and filmmakers engaging protection of the oceans. She curates the United Nations World Ocean Day, which is huge, um, and that's the photo competition that she does. Um, Ellen loves cold diving in Arctic conditions and the darkness and silence in cave diving. And she's also a member of the Women Divers Hall of Fame since 2019. Without ado, Ellen, it's all yours. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Chantel. So you have my presentation? Yes, you're my guardian. So first of all, thank you, Chantal and the Diver Medic for these amazing set of webinars you're hosting. Uh, I think this is number 35, 36, I don't know, and you're still going. I don't know where you get the energy, but you're um, contributing big time to the whole dive industry. So thank you from all of us. Um, my last webinar, well, my first and last webinar with you was about um, my journey into diving and photography and the health issues I had. And we talked a bit about photography. So um, some people wanted to hear more about it. Um, so this is the talk I will share with you. It's about the deeper connection and how you can take images with an impact on the viewers so people should start caring and acting more. So first of all, for those who don't know me, uh, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but um, I like to talk about me through my images. So this is me and who I am defines how I shoot. I think as a photographer, so excuse me for the little delay with the images because I'm working with two screens, but as a photographer, I think every image that you take have, has to reflect who you are and who am I? I'm obviously, I'm a woman, I love the ocean, I'm a mother, I'm a friend, I try to be compassionate, I'm an historian too, I'm a daughter, a sister, I'm an explorer, I've, I'm a fighter curious and determined. And I think you can see that all in almost any image, even if it's a peaceful one or a more dynamic one. Um, who I am defines how I shoot, and it doesn't matter if it's in the cold waters of Norway or in warmer waters in Hawaii. It doesn't matter if it's day or night. I shoot in a certain way, and a shot does not just happen. I choose to shoot my subject, and that's what you see. So I never just go for a shot. I always want to express what I feel during an encounter and I can't even shoot before I feel a connection. I need to feel my subject and um, ideally I want to be accepted by the pot to be accepted by the subject I'm capturing. But before I go on and tell you all about the importance to me of having this deeper connection with subject, with nature, I want to talk a bit about us being ocean ambassadors. And it doesn't matter if you're a diver or not a diver, 
just enjoy your coastal walks or if you are a photographer filmmaker it doesn't happen it doesn't matter how much experience you have but i think these times we have to um we have to be ocean ambassadors and i know many of you agree uh, we have to protect what is left we have to protect so it, it, it our oceans become healthy again, our planet becomes healthy again. So for photographers, manipulation of wildlife, macro life, it's a no-no. Touching wildlife, it's a no-go. Not only because it can harm wildlife, because but also because we have to lead by example. And that's a very important given. Uh, we have to practice what we preach. And um, since 2016, I have been curating the United Nations World Oceans Day photo competition, which is kindly hosted by Dive Photo Guide. And um, I have been giving a lot of thought about what is the right image. Is it the most stunning image or is it the image that is taken with respect for nature? And to me, it is the image that is taken with every respect for nature. And um, I think it's time that we stop rewarding images that um, are just a, a show off with disrespect for nature because they fuel competition in a non-constructive way and we want to uh, be ocean ambassadors in a constructive way. So um, this year, many competitions, well always many competitions have guidelines and rules, but if um, judges and uh, contestants don't have the dialogue of what is wrong or right, um, we, we keep pacing in the same place. So this year, I, uh, with help from a few friends, we developed this charter with 40 commitments about what a photographer should do, not just shoot images, but also, for example, um, not use single-use plastic anymore. And we all visit dive shows or see um, talks at dive shows. It's, it's a no to like the plastic we use and, and, and bring your own reusable bottle and even for water, for coffee, for tea, there's no more excuse to not start with yourself at this time. So the guidelines have um, those things also shoot locally, ask a fair price for your images, protect the industry also. Um, and I, I was very happy with um, those new commitments and I hope many other competitions will um, pick this up and behave like that, make their contestants behave in that way. It's all about contribution and working on the same goal, protecting the oceans. Uh, back to the deeper connections. So before you immerse yourself in the water, you should gain knowledge, not just knowledge about diving, marine environment and animal behavior, but also the dive skills, knowledge and skills um, to dive safe, to not harm the environment, the skills to uh, handle your camera gear and to handle the camera to know what you're doing actually because if you don't know it on land you're not gonna be able to pull it off on the water. It's uh, actually a never-ending learning process so we combine this underwater photography with diving. We achieve skills, we try to master them under all conditions, choppy, flat, deep, shallow, and then we take everything down with us. Uh, when we immerse, we apply the skills on the subject matter, if it appears. So it's one sentence, but it's a lot of hard work. And since I started this journey, my priorities have been um, animal behavior. So to know as much as I can, diving to be as um, skilled as I can be and photography. Um, yeah, first you have to be a diver and um, I stopped diving because of health issues, not because I was a bad diver, but my heart did not agree with the way I was diving. So this is actually a former webinar. You can still see it on the Diver Medic website on the webinar on demand. So if you want to know more about that, just giving a little recap, I stopped diving for two to three years. I excelled in extreme snorkeling in uh, Arctic conditions. I went back to diving with a different agency, raid instruction. I could find myself better in that way of teaching. I understood all my limitations better. And now when I, uh, I went to sideman diving and I became a full 
uh, cave diver in 2018. So the limitations that I thought I had were actually no limitations anymore, but I will only dive my limits and limit my dive. So for example, um, depth and strong currents are still a no-go for me, but I am okay with that. And to put all my training to the test, I enjoyed some cold dry suit diving to the wrecks of Bell Island in Newfoundland. And it was just stunning, not only because of the visibility and um, because of the history of that place, but also to experience how much I've learned by investing in more dive training, mixing up different dives, different gear. It made me more aware and confident diver. And I followed the caves with no room for error at all. And after training for three weeks, two and a half weeks, three weeks without a camera, with a total focus on an environment that is fragile, stunning, but also unforgiving. Um, buoyancy control is key at all times. And if you think you have your buoyancy control um, under control in uh, the open water, just um, it will surprise you in an environment with different references. So you need to be switched on at all times because you have to anticipate on every next step that's the key and all that together makes you a better diver and a better photographer um, so again like in my former talk i'm not preaching that you all have to be cave divers but you i do want to emphasize that even as a photographer filmmaker first you are a diver and second you are a photographer or filmmaker so in short after my cave training i took baby steps into cave photography and that's going to be continued. I'm just showing a few of my shots in this environment that is totally new for me. So I have to learn again all about light. I have to, um, just like connecting with animals, I want to connect with the cave. So I, I don't like to go in and set up lights. I want to feel my shots. So it's no different than um, with only this one was staged because it was a shot we needed. Um, but for the rest, I just try to shoot what I see at the moment. Once you are in control, how do you get the best time underwater? How can you create a shot with an impact to the viewer? I mentioned the knowledge, the skills you need to have regarding animal behavior and diving. Um, a very important one is to be inspired. And when you are inspired, you can also be inspiring. So in my, my everything process, I just love to look at images other people took. And I try to define what I like, what I don't like, what draws me in, what bores me, and so on. And those images can be topside, on the water, they can be landscapes, seascapes, portraits, sceneries. And in the same way that I look at other people's images, I look at mine and I'm my biggest critic. And this shot is a shot that has inspired me quite a bit. It's by Brian Scarry, National Geo. I saw it before I started my journey into diving. I even have it in my office. Um, it's, um, it's a stunning shot and I always get happy when I look at it and I always know that I need to work harder and investigate better. Um, and those hard seals are an important part of the work I do yeah, during the last years. My favorite images are not always images that are perfect, uh, technically perfect, but they have to touch me in a certain way. It's very hard to explain, but they have to appeal to my higher senses. They must get me in a state of wondering, dreaming. They have to touch emotions in me that are usually in a safer place. And to me, a lot of my Photography is permanent healing. Um, it's a bit like sitting in a museum. You sit in front of a work and you, in front of a painting and you get carried away to another world. You forget about everything when you're there and you just want to be. You just have to feel. And one of my motives in life when I'm stuck in a situation is actually to surround myself with beauty because I believe inspiration and motivation are born in that zone where you just are, just be. I managed to get some recognition for my work in a very short time. 
uh, we touch hearts and uh, bring comfort. And of course, what I still try to do the most is to get more people love the ocean and all its life in and around it. And you have seen that I show some images topside also, but these are marine, um, marine life. And I don't want to make the distinction between topside images and underwater shots. It's all related. And this is an image I shot this year um, in the former talk. You can hear the story about it. Sadly, this was a harp seal pup um, getting stuck in the ice because the ice was too thin. And this is a story I keep working on. To capture beauty, you have to be able to see it. And beauty is everywhere. It can be in the small critters or in the bigger ones. You can capture beauty in color or you can capture it in black and white. You can capture it when you see it in an abundance of life and you can capture it in a certain emptiness. Immerse the whole you, be a blue mind, be genuine in what you do. Your personal life, your past, present, future, it will all leave traces in your work. Um, the music you love, the books you read, the encounters you have, don't shy those, don't shy to show emotions. We talked about inspiration, how to find it, how to be it. So how to shoot with an impact. And my apologies for the slides again. It's uh, due to the conversion of Keynote to PowerPoint. So how to draw a viewer in. Um, my secret to shooting is actually to observe your subject, to connect with it, wait, and shoot. But even if you're a beginner or um, you're not really a photographer, you just take a uh, uh, point and shoot, share every shot because um, every shot that you take on the water can have an impact without words because you are sharing a world that not many of us ever witness on the water. Um, so keep sharing, even if it's not <laughs> like a, a masterpiece. If the shot is appealing, of course, it helps more. But the best chances on a good wildlife shot are observe, connect, wait, and shoot. Let the animal explore you and explore the camera. And when both animal and photographer are at ease, then you can start shooting. Then you can start working on the shot. Here, the shark is looking and the light is a bit off. Uh, it's just a documenting shot, but it's where I start working on what I really want. I'm getting closer here. My subject is a bit better lit and it is better defined. But I want this shot, uh, the animal looking through my lens, through my dome, my lens, through my eyes. I can see through my eyes and that's how I convey the feeling I have to the viewer. Um, Maybe I can say a bit about the surface you see in the shot. Um, sometimes people shoot downward and there is no right or wrong in photography. You have to shoot what you feel, but some images have more impact than others. And here you see the surface and our brains are wired certainly for non-divers. When they can't see the surface, they don't really like a shot. <laughs> so yeah, having the surface in your shot, it's what they call creating the wow factor because it gives the brain certainly for non-ocean people this feeling that they can escape so just a side note um i don't hear it a lot but it's a very important given but again there is no right or wrong when you create an intimacy uh, when you have the shot you want where the connection between the photographer the animal to the viewer happens, that's when you create an intimacy. And that's the place we all want to be. And it's the place where the viewer connects with the subject that wants to know more or starts to care. Um, a very important thing to get those shots with an impact is eye contact. Um, having a connection with your subject makes eye contact more easy. Uh, even with animals so big that you can hardly see the eye. Uh, so this is a sperm whale, it's a big animal, 
and actually in comparison a small eye but it's there for sure and it's looking straight at me if you have a cheeky eye this one is looks cheeky when it's actually a shark less than a meter long it's a galapagos shark those little juvenile sharks can actually be the more snappy ones so i call them cheeky can be an innocent eye a very majestic and endangered eye and the eye if you include it in the image should be as sharp as possible um, it's not always possible um, i hear michael in the other room and it resonates in the sound so <laughs> sorry to interrupt um, if the eyes in the, sh in the shot keep it as sharp as possible like the eye of the tiger and of course in some conditions the water column is hard to work around um, here it's water with thermoclines and the conditions also make the shot so the the, the rooster of the beluga whale is very sharp and the eye gets lost a bit in the thermocline, but this is part of the story. Um, this is an illustration about the conditions you work. This is in uh, Hudson Bay, uh, Canada. So the thermocline actually makes it impossible to shoot. So the animals have to be really close to my fish islands, my dome, um, and only then you can get a decent shot but it doesn't mean you don't have to shoot. Um, the eye again is hidden in the thermocline. Eyes do make the soul of an image. So try to have it as sharp as possible. Um, if you can't get the eye, go for pose or action. A tail shot or a specific pose can be as strong as eye contact. And don't get wound up in the water. It's very bad for the vibes of what is happening in the ocean. And also the difference between somebody taking shots and being a professional photographer, a professional in the true sense of the word, can be that a shooter gets wound up when he doesn't get the shot, he or she. But a photographer assesses the situation and works with what is there. For example, this shot behind me were two people shooting and they had an amazing encounter. So I just sat back, um, step back or swim back, snorkel back and let them have enjoy the encounter. I'm not going to swim in front of other people that have are busy taking good images. So I just turn around and there was a story because it's not backscatter what you see in this image. It's actually two things. It's um, particles. So the orca is hunting in the fjords in Norway and they hunt for herring. When the herring are chased, they release stress bubbles. And that's one thing you see, but also the way the orcas hunt with, um, they slap their tails and they paralyze the, the herring. So you can also see fish scales in the shot. So this shot, it's not a clean shot, but it tells a story. So just work with what you have. Um, for example, this tail, this is a treasure shark in Malapascua. The tail is one of the most important features of this shark because it is their weapon. They have a very small mouth, small teeth, and they, they hunt with their tail. So that can be a very interesting shot. Um, again, a tail shot of a small Galapagos shark. It was, I think, a meter and a bit, but not bigger. But it looks like an impressive big shark. Um, this is a cute shot. You don't have the eye, but um, just shoot when you when something like this happens because above the water you can see in a half shell a bit of the the area. It's in the springs. They are there to keep warm, and it tells a story also. Shapes make images like a stealth mode of an oceanic white tip definitely leaves an impression. Uh, perspective makes an image and action or behavior can make the image too even more when there is a connection so in this case it was a, a very um, intense encounter with two pots of male belugas and I had to get out in the end of the water but it was just an amazing encounter and I'm with this animal looking straight through my lens through me to the viewer again it's um, it's a very strong shot although again the eyes get lost in the thermocline. And I think even also most of the animal gets lost, but I just kept shooting. 
if animals allow you to be in the middle of their action, to be part of the action, like in the middle of a hunt, that can be create a strong image. To be part of the pot, again, to be accepted is very important. And then there is light and light is the holy grail of photography. So a little recap, the way to draw the viewer in is to observe, connect, wait and shoot. A few pointers are eye contact, pose, and now we go to light. I love subtle light. I strive to make the best use of natural light. And when I need to fill it a bit, then I prefer either a bit of stroke when it's small animals or video light because you can um, blend it more easy with the natural light. Big animals is a different game and is a different talk, but I do want to touch the subject of shooting with video lights because many emerging photographers focus on gear. Um, they want a setup, a camera, a housing, stroke arms, two strokes, and then they're ready to go. But one of the biggest lessons when I started was by Alex Mustard when he did a workshop here on island. And the first thing we needed to do on a, um, a dive on the Kitty Week, which is a, a wreck, quite shallow, is to leave strokes behind. Because how can you learn about light if you don't know what is available? So learn to shoot with what is available. Learn to observe the light. It's very important. Uh, for example, this is a shot with one solar light, one video light. And to me, it's a bit like extending the sunlight because the sunlight comes on the seal, hits the seal in an angle from the left. But if I wouldn't have used a solar light to give a bit more fill, his beautiful face with the whiskers would have been lost. It would be dark or I had to crank my settings. So just by filling it a bit, like an extension of the existing light, it still is a natural shot. And you gain definition by using a bit of light. Um, you gain the definition that you lack because of bad visibility or when you only use natural light and the light is in front of you instead of behind you. So, by, but using a video light will save you from creating a spotlight on a bigger animal. Light moves, uh, light uses the law of physics, but it sure moves hearts too. So it's a very important to, to learn to read it. And I'm just going to show you a few shots that I would have not been able to shoot if I didn't understand light and the use of extra light. So I prefer natural light, but sometimes you have to use a bit more. Like here I am shooting against the light. So I filled it with a bit of um, video light to have this um, stingray lighted. This is a shot, just natural light, where I choose to um, underexpose the bottom part of the picture because the sky, other, if I would overexpose or expose correctly, then it would um, be um, a total blowout in the upper part of the image. So that these things you can correct quite easily with a filter, a filter actually in post-processing. Um, so I prefer that. Um, these are just a few shots, natural light. Um, this is here in Grand Cayman it, um, in the grottoes, Eden Rock and Devil's Grotto. Just go at the right time of day. So if you understand light, you also understand the making of an image. It's all about working with elements with the right time of day, working with the weather and working with your inspiration. And when you observe, connect, wait and shoot while working with that light, it shows in the images and being in control of your dive gives you the energy to completely focus on the animals and the shots that you aim for. Um, being at peace, being in the ocean enhances the connection. Um, here, the, it's a mother bottlenose that came up in an empty blue um, pelagic zone to show me her calm. So this is one of the things I really enjoy the most, go into the pelagic zone and bop in the ocean for a few hours and just wait until something comes up. Some days nothing comes, it's blue desert. Um, but when magic happens in that zone, it's quite intense. So you have to be prepared at all times. You have to be switched on at all times. 
your settings have to be right at all times. So there's a bit more clouds, there's a bit, um, the sun gets higher. You have to adapt the whole time. And that's probably when you are in water for a few hours, you can be exhausted, not just because you are physically exhausted, but the brain is a part of our body and it, it can be really um, a tremendous job keeping focus at all times to make the most of a moment when it happens because that moment can be gone in the blink of an eye. So be switched on at all times. Uh, be prepared. Dial in those settings the whole time and take the shots. Also, an important one is to simplify your shots. When you have a perfect shape like this, you don't need a lot of negative space. So not all images have to be award-winning or you don't have to shoot the whole time to enter competitions. Just shoot what you want to shoot and how you want to portray the animal. Grab the moment, always be prepared. Um, and be one with marine life. So one of the things when I feel bad vibes in a group of people, I don't even try to shoot because I do think it um, it has a, an effect on wildlife. So I try to keep it on um, half an hour. So thank you for listening to the talk, but I have enough time to take questions if um, anybody of the public the people listening have questions. So Chantal, you can take over. Maybe Chantal is having a little break. <laughs> um, all right. Um, thank you very, very much, Ellen. Sorry, I clicked on the um, the mic button and it was just whirling and whirling. I'm thinking, ah, oh, I can't get in. Um, right. So anybody have any questions? Cindy says, thank you. Your heartfelt passion shines. Oh, that is so true. Um, right. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, he has your chance, everybody. So you can ask me anything except um, two technical details because like this morning on the panel too, I'm not really a technical shooter. I know what I do, but I, I am one with my camera and one try to be one with my subject and a lot of what ha what happens in the water is just um, dialing in, feeling the shot, deciding at the moment how I want to portray it. You are just very genuine, um, Ellen, um, and um, I can read in the comments here, absolutely amazing. This is Melanie, absolutely amazing. I've learned so much about how to think about what I am doing underwater. Um, me, yeah, uh, Melanie, it's indeed not all about technicality and um, concentrating too much on the gear. It's about your subject, and I see many new photographers concentrating too much on the gear. You can sort out the gear topside. You can um, practice with your camera, learn to um, deal with it on land so that once you get in the water, all the frustrations about this is not working, that is not working, it's not giving me what I want. Those frustrations, leave them on land. Because once you're in the ocean, and even if it doesn't happen like a great connection with an animal, just enjoy being in the ocean and, and not forget that it's about amazing privilege that we are witness to be there. So I, I do believe it's an important factor that um, many forget once you want, everybody wants that shot of that shark and that encounter, but sometimes you just have to just enjoy. Um, Miguel says, amazing photos and presentation. Where can we find your work? Ellen, would you mind putting in the comments um, your contact details, please, for everybody to have? Yes, I will do that. And um, like on the last talk, on the last webinar with um, Chantal, we decided I was going to write a coffee table book. <laughs> and I did start. So yeah. it's coming soon. Um, well, soon, give me a year. Uh, Lots of my work has been also in exhibitions like New York. I had three there and um, it's a, a, a privilege to bring um, marine environment into a big city. So I really enjoy that because every person then coming up to you and wants to talk about the animals that they don't have a real bond with or they will never see. It's, it's my way of contributing to make them care and I really enjoy that. 
Um, Dan Orr, who's also a very good photographer, um, he yeah. says, excellent presentation, thank you very much. Um, he's got some amazing wildlife photography. Um, yeah. Dan Orr. Um, Don says, are there times of the day you suggest for beginners interested in using natural light rather than becoming a gearhead and um, buying strobes? Yes, like the golden light or like a dawn blue light, those are, um, the, the light is slow, so you can, it's easy to have it behind you, but then also if you are in the shallows, so you can even practice while snorkeling, just in the shallows you have this beautiful refraction or the impregnation of sunlight in the water at those hours and and just cap capturing that sunlight it, it's amazing if there's a fish in it or another creature but capturing those light rays is a is a is the best exercise to go in the water and try to capture it you can um, change your settings you can um, experiment with it because you have to make your own image not follow the rules the whole time there is no right there is no wrong create your own style and just enjoy um capturing we have the luxury these days of having digital camera we have the luxury we can process and it doesn't cost us in developing film just a year initially that's the cost so just go in the water and shoot 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 and then and, and change everything and then look at your settings. So even in the beginning, you don't really have to think what you're doing in the water. It's nice if you could, but I call it manual bracketing. Just pump it up, pump it down, and see what it does, and see then how you can work with them in um, post-processing. It's very important that you create your style and um, that you shoot in function of what you want to create. So you will learn that some things, you can't keep, make a good, uh, a bad image a good one just by post-processing, but you can think about the process, making the image, and then uh, fine-tuning it in uh, post-processing. But it's important that you, um, that you try different things. Uh, thank you, Ellen. And before I um, ask, uh, well, before I read up Michael Hayes' question, um, Claire Kingsbury and Ellen don't answer this yet, um, but um, Claire asks, what is your favorite animal to shoot? And I would like everybody to kind of guess what if I, and it's not the picture I showed here, what might be, um, but uh, guess what Ellen's favorite um, animal is to shoot. So if you can um, guess, let's see who's right. Um, going to Michael Hayes, he says, what was your uh, progression of your cameras and lighting, your first setup um, to your current setup? Um, I started with an Olympus EPL-2. It's a micro four thirds camera uh, with one stroke. That was my start. And I bought it when I started diving and then I, um, enrolled in a workshop with Alex Mustard here on island because I didn't have to travel, I could just participate. And the only thing I needed to buy extra was a fish eye lens and a dome for my little camera. And there is one shot of all the participants in the pool with their big cameras and me with this little camera. But with that camera, I shot uh, award winning images. And only when I started selling my images, and it, it, it happened quite fast um, after that, it's only when I started publishing and selling my images that I upgraded to a full frame camera and it's still the same as I have now. It's a Nikon D800 with a fish island, 16 mil, and a 230 dome, Zen, Zen dome port, which I absolutely love because I also don't like to change lenses the whole time so i can shoot macro it's not my favorite because of um, my physical limitations i had a, an undeserved bend and my right arm is not as strong as i want and i'm shooting macro is very um, tiring so my favorite setup is uh, bigger animals with my 16 mil fisheye lens um, and it's actually an extension of my eyes it's an extension. I can shoot almost blindly sometimes because I know what I'm doing and I don't switch lenses the whole time. I like to have my one to go. Excellent. Um, Ellen, um, here's the question to you. 
what is your favorite animal to shoot? <laughs> I think um, some people have it right. It's uh, definitely seals. Um, oh, awesome. Yes, that, um, and one of the best places to shoot seals, it's great seals then, is in England, the Farne Islands. It's my favorite dive ever. Um, you have kelp, you have playful seals, curious seals. So if you live in England, it's the, the one and only, I, I, would, I could go in the water there every day. And of course, I also like hard seals, but those conditions are <laughs> much harder. It's harder to get there. Um, I, I love whales, I love sharks, I, I love belugas. There's a big difference also between marine mammals like seals and, and, and beluga whales and, and sperm whales and sharks. Sharks are fish. Fish are easier to recognize a pattern, the way they behave, while marine mammals are so intelligent, they can really, um, they, they decide to play with you. They decide if you will have an encounter. So the connection is sometimes harder. And it's also, you have to be more careful. Uh, certainly with whales, like sperm whales, they dive to depths of 3,000 feet to go feeding on, um, on squid. That's, th those are not animals to mess with. Well, most people would say, oh, I'm more afraid of sharks or I'm more in, um, in awe of sharks because you shouldn't be afraid if you know your behavior. But I am more careful with marine mammals. Like with um, the beluga whale encounter, they became so excited. <laughs> I don't know why, but it was two pots of male and they really accepted me as one of their own. And I could see things happening that was, they were snapping, showing dominance behavior. I got out of the water because that was the moment I needed to get out of the water because it could have become um, rough. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ellen. Um, I, <laughs> I keep on going to the, sh the shots that you're talking about because it's just so interesting to be able to, um, you know, listen to that. Um, Aisha says, could you expand on bad vibes in the group, um, like chasing the shot, maybe? Uh, what was it? Chasing the shot? Shot. Or? Yeah, chasing shot. the shot. Um, yes. So if you go in the water, there's this one rule for myself and, and I, I know the best like the world-class photographers have the same rules you can't predict wildlife you can't um, predict an encounter you can just try to be there at the right moment and try to be there at during a migration obviously or a time when the animals are there but you can't go and say today I'm gonna shoot this or today I'm going to shoot that. Of course, with stingrays, it's a bit easier, but you might not get the shot you want because the weather conditions are not as they should be. So go into the water without any expectations. You can only be as best prepared as you can, and that's your responsibility. But then you go into the water and see what happens. Um, give it some time. But if you're in a group and you're with people, they book a holiday and they have these wishes, like I need a shot of this, a shot of that, a shot of this, and they only want to dedicate one dive to that subject, it doesn't work. Well, it can work. You, you can sometimes get lucky, have a lucky shot, but most of the shots that you see in this presentation is because it's a dedicated trip so I go to the same dive site again and again and again and again until I think, yeah, this is it. For example, I visited the Belugas in Hudson Bay one year and I came home with no image because the visibility was just horrible and then the weather conditions changed. It's a very hard trip to get there with all your luggage. Um, but I had to go back and I went back and the second year I was better prepared and things happened um, because I knew a bit more about behavior too and also because it was just good vibes in the water. If I'm in, in, in a group and, and I have all these um, people going for the same shot, I turn around and I go for a different shot. And it's even very obvious on my, I attended two workshops in the Cayman Islands with uh, Alex Mustard. The shots we needed to take because everybody needed to take them and was lining up. I don't have those shots because 
I just I, I see something else and I get distracted. I, I I turn around and I see a big school of fish in an in a in a beautiful setting with beautiful light and shadows, and that's where I am. And of course, with photographers, you have to body dive. But now I I um, I dive side mount. I have my own redundancy. It's safer. I'm more confident, and I'm I, I just yeah shoot what I see, shoot what happens. But I need good vibes. I, I don't like elbow pushing and, and and chasing animals. It's a no go. I don't like most shot staging, like um, trying to get the animal um, in your direction because you chase it. I, I can't do it. And sometimes I just leave the water if I see those things happening. But after a while, you know the people you want to die for and the people you don't want to die for. It. Um, but of course, if you book a holiday and it's a liverboard, you can't always choose. So stay away from bad vibes. And sometimes by staying away, you be rewarded with good karma and with an encounter nobody else has. So that's my advice. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Juan says, what wonderful shots and thank you for you sharing them. Wonderful tips too about studying natural light and being in the moment too. Uh, Melanie says, um, I just have a simple point and shoot, but your idea of making a connection before anything else applies to every underwater experience. Will yeah. says, well, sorry, did you, sorry, I'm like. No, um, even with a point and shoot, you can create amazing images if you have the patience and you, you, you get the connection. So it, it's not the camera, it's really you taking the shot. And of course, uh, a better camera, technically a better camera will allow you to have a, a great shot and to um, have a big print of it. So, but the shots just for you can be as beautiful and also for other viewers can be as beautiful as if you would shoot with a bigger camera. Um, many years ago when I was doing photography, I would take something like 200 images and out of those 200 images, there'd be about two that were really good. Um, so, you know, I guess it, it's with everybody, but I, I'm not like um, the person who has the eye for photography. So I think you've really got to be patient as well, I guess. You have to be patient, but indeed, you, you, if you in one year have 10 amazing images and then you shoot, for example, seven years, you have 70 amazing images in your portfolio. So don't push it when it's not happening, just enjoy them and, and build the portfolio. Yeah, it's true. And um, Will says a thousand thanks, Ellen. Superb, beautiful and thought provoking images. Uh, Chris Branson says gorgeous photos. Thank you. Uh, Melanie says, um, well, Melanie says, sorry, um, some of my shots are actually quite good, but I've lacked confidence. And I, I mean, I, I guess that you build your confidence the more you take photographs. Isn't that true? Um, it's also about believing in your own shots. And um, there, there's this, some people shoot really for competitions. And, and then when you believe in your own shot and you, you don't get rewarded, people can, um, the confidence, lowers a bit but yeah. you, you're shooting for yourself and you should um if you like an image just keep believing in it and um, if you if you want like some more advice because sometimes also people you have to look at your shot in a rational way too um is it as good as you think yourself or can you make it better by little things like go low go close shoot upwards those are a few pointers that can make even an image with a point and shoot, like looking like a professional image. Um, you can always get some advice with a professional, just one hour or something like one-on-one -on -one to review images. And, and that can build your confidence, but it can also build your skills. Um, Thanks, Helen. Um, this is great photographs or photos. You obviously create mindfully to create impact. What are the best ways of sharing those images to achieve that goal? Um, I think we all start by sharing images on social media. And um, it's the way my voice and uh, conservation grew louder um, by sharing an image that people did like. And then I was allowed a bit more time so I could tell the stories. So I think that is um, 
it gets more um, attention of me the last five years to share the story. So I also went on these um, photography websites. I think those days it was 500 px, and I started sharing my underwater images, but always with a story about the sharks, shark finning, that you don't have to fear sharks because the oceans need it. And without actually putting a lot of effort in it, just with every image telling the story, those group of followers became bigger and bigger and the voice becomes louder and louder. And I think that's the way to go. So an image because of an image is just an image and there's amazing images in the world. So I'm not the best shooter, but I, I really want to tell the stories and to grab the attention of the viewer, the, the, the image has to be impactful. But I know my um, weaknesses in shooting, but I also know my strength and my strength is the connection, like the, um, the, the connection with the animals and really coming to me. And, and I even do little conversations underwater with the animals in my mind, like, um, I want to protect you, just be calm, can I look at this side? And sometimes it works, it's all about connecting given the good vibe off. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Erin says, good to hear that you did well with your MP, EPM2. Um, he has uh, an EPM1. Yeah, it's a, it's a great camera. And um, I, I, would, I would not start with a full frame, um, starting photography and diving with full frame. No, this was a perfect, little camera I could take everywhere and one stroke really made me think about how to use it. And, um, and I learned a lot with that camera. And I used it, I even took it as a backup camera when I did remote uh, trips. So I, I used it um, until three years ago and then it died on me. So, but I can't discard of it because I'm really attached to it. And I apologize, Erin, I'm not quite sure um, your name. Um, I don't know if, I, I don't know where it comes from. So I hope I, I didn't say the wrong thing because I just realized that um, there is no gender on there. Um, so I do apologize if I said the wrong thing. Uh, Jess says, how can we improve underwater photography behavior? So often I see semi-pro and amateur underwater photographers bash coral to get into the position of the macro, um, uh, push in front of other divers, irritate sea um, life, and do whatever they can to get the shot. Um, and yes. very they are the ones um, on the boat who have the amazing pictures because they do whatever it takes um, to get the shot. I think it's a bit, um, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm offending people with saying this, but it's a bit like the bad behavior with the dog. If you don't reward it anymore in competitions, they will stop doing it because it's be it is because those images are still being rewarded and people don't speak up because it's a small world. But it's actually so bad that some resorts in uh, Asia, if they have photographers staying, like groups of photographers, they try to not have other people staying because the other people are so annoyed by some behavior of underwater photographers. And I feel so bad because I'm also an underwater photographer, but I would never do something like that. So that's the reason um, I had conversations with lots of people in this industry. Um, for, for example, Adam Hanlon from um, WetPixel, because we do care about the environment, but also about our reputation and the reputations of other people doing the right thing. So, and that is the reason that I talked to United Nations and um, UNESCO, if I could implement these commitments, and it's all about not distressing animals, not damaging reefs, but it's so much more, because how can you say you love the ocean when you just use out of convenience? So it's about being this whole ocean person. And I think the more people talk about it and it's not I don't want to be an annoying person but and it's also in the guidelines um, that we have to talk about it in a constructive way so I don't want to bash people online in, in fora I don't want to convict people I don't want to point fingers but I want to say maybe you can do it this way but I don't support um, 
cursing and some of the things that happen on social media, like bashing people. I just want a constructive dialogue of how we should behave. And it's part of, um, of changing mindsets of photographers, but partly also not reward those images. And if you see those images rewarded in competitions, do contact um, the organizers and talk about it because they, they are very concerned about it. And I have been judging competitions where there were concerns about um, how an image was taken and by the photographer and they get, we look into it and they get disqualified. And, um, and somebody else get the winning image. So it's very important to speak up. Even if you, you don't want to uh, speak up in front of a lot of people, but you worry about something, go to the people from the resort and talk about it because they should address it too. And many want to address. I was judging a competition in um, Anilau, like the underwater shootout. And there all the guides had briefings about what was allowed, what was not allowed, and how they would get disqualified. And um, even when people thought something was not well, um, re re regarding the rules and was not in respect to wildlife, people were taking out. So they take it quite seriously. It's about um, protecting what we have left and standing on coral is never okay. In the old days, people didn't care. And you can see it also in, in age sometimes, but um, it's not done. There's no more excuse. Yeah, I had a um, I had a friend tell me about a company who went um, to um, uh, uh, Australasia and they were actually doing a, a photo shoot of a, a model and wearing the company's stuff. Um, and, um, and when they got the footage back, the company was like, we can't use this and um the people who, who did the footage said well why and they went because you have our product with somebody who's standing on coral or holding onto coral and having um her photograph been taken and that's not what we're all about so um you know it, you know it goes around it definitely goes around yeah. and isn't it sad that you have to tell people that that is not okay like yeah. people that know the ocean. I think it's very sad that we have to speak up. I wish I didn't have to, but nobody, well, a lot of people do it. We all have to do it to create this ripple effect that it's okay to speak up and, and you don't get bashed for speaking up because that's what happened in the past. It's really good now because there are people who are talking up against it and a lot of things are changing but um you know if you look at 10 years ago it was like you know you, you can't talk about it because yeah. you didn't want to be like that person who moans or complains or whatever the case may be right. but it's all about protecting the oceans as well as i mean like that's not our domain that's their domain you know yeah. we're just very lucky that we have the equipment to be able to go underwater and to be able to take these amazing images like you have um in front of us and um so we have to respect that you know it's like if somebody comes into your house and they start like moving things around and stuff like that or even in your your vehicle and that's disrespectful so um that's kind of what we need to do um so i i agree with what you say so tony says right only the tool a means to an end it is the person behind the camera that makes the shot that's true yeah and he also says uh tony also says thanks for a great presentation ellen um i think you know michael mars um he says one of the best i'm not quite sure he's oh i think he was referring to singing to the animals as well do you sing to the animals I you do. I don't think they disappear, Ellen. <laughs> I just do because sometimes they react well and, um, and I can keep the encounter going a bit longer. And it depends on which animal, which noise I make. <laughs> <laughs> do you actually, no, I have to ask you, do you actually make animal noises? Like, they? do you try to imitate them? I do a bit of whale and I do a bit of turtle. And I just, so That's sorry. So cool. I love it. I'm blushing. No, don't, don't, because I probably would have done the same, and I think half of us would have done that as well. You know, trying to mimic. I mean, like, I mean, if I meet somebody, one with the animal, I just yeah, understand. absolutely. No, I, I, thank I, you for inviting me in your place, and can we now take a nice image? And most of the time, they react really well. Yeah. If I if I do the singing, the whale singing, 
at home and my kids hear it, they just go like, oh no, there she goes again. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be one of the the, um, the animals is, is just too perfect. And I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that most of us do it. I mean, I, I sometimes bark at my dogs hoping that they'll understand what I'm saying, but um, that's just me, I'm a bit crazy anyway. Um, yeah, Tony, I can do Dory. Like, I speak well. <laughs> You get swallowed up if you do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do it now because this is recorded. If it would be like a one-off, I would do oh, it. Come on, Ellen. Oh, come on. Yeah, I, I didn't practice like for so long, but it's something like. <laughs> come on, you've got. You have to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a you're such a star. Thank you for doing that. I'm sure <laughs> Michael said don't. <laughs> um right, so um we'll be, be a little bit more serious now. Um so oh yes, Graham was actually having a, a go, uh, rightly so. Um he said no one should behave like that, irrespective of what um or who they are, and I agree with that. Melanie says, uh, this has been a life-changing presentation for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, okay. Um, Tony says, should we now refer to Ellen as Dory? Yes, ha ha. Yes, definitely, Dory. Um, and then obviously, um, <laughs> yeah, Juan says, but it works, ha ha. So he's obviously done it as well, you know. Uh, Dave says, another great webinar. Thank you both. Uh, <laughs> um, Jess says, Ellen Doolittle, yes, um, Dr. Ellen Doolittle. And then Lucy Will says, um, just keep swimming. Well, what an amazing um, presentation and so natural. Um, I love it when, you know, everything is so natural. Um, so thank you very, very much, Ellen, for, for joining us again on this uh, webinar, this live webinar, which is now recorded, all your voice overs. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, I can't. I don't no, know. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> um, for those of you who joined us today, thank you so, so very much. It's just so amazing that you're, you know, here, like some of you, every single day, um, and I'm um, supporting um, these. Uh, Joe posters really enjoyed the images. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Joe. And um, well, tomorrow is um, our day off. Uh, well, my day off um, after doing something like 36 webinars um, or probably a little bit more. Um, not far from 50 now, um, the people set up. But uh, Sunday, we actually have another Women Divers Hall of, uh, honorary member of Women Divers Hall of Fame, um, who is actually in my class 2016, and that is Dawn Canadras. Um, and she's going to be talking about. Um, the body um human performance and extreme um environments and i think that's going to be extremely interesting so not tomorrow tomorrow's your day off and my day off um but we will definitely have um dawn who will be here on sunday and the invitations will all go out to you um so uh hopefully you'll be able to join us um once again ellen thank you so so very much um thank you michael for giving us a bit of a laugh as well um and um for the rest of you, I hope you have a wonderful evening or morning or afternoon or wherever you are. God bless and um, be safe. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, Ellen. Good night.